much, Ms. Evelyn Tirana, for your extravagant introduction. <laughs> In the last part, Evelyn made me sound like different kinds of animals, <laughs> and thereby implies that I could probably be called a zookeeper. <laughs> Previously, Dean Raul Pangalangan told me that he was one of my students in political law, and he also told me when I arrived that this is final exam time in UP College of Law. That is why there is a funereal silence in the college. <laughs> People are either studying or going way over to Manila near Malacanang to pray to St. Jude, the patron saint of the hopeless. <laughs> I give Raul for his complimentary language in my favor this morning, a grade 1.0. <laughs> and I promise to talk to President Aquino about your potential membership in the Supreme Court. <laughs> After all, there are so many other justices seated there who belong to the wrong law school. <laughs> You know that I'm always very fond of genies in bottles. So although I was abroad, I hastily, I made haste to come back home when I heard of the floods in Kalumpit, Bulacan. Sure enough, when I walked around, along the banks of the river, I saw a bottle and inside was a genie. <laughs> when I opened the bottle, the genie said, don't make three wishes, just make one. I'm undernourished. <laughs> And I'm suffering because of the Eurozone crisis in Europe and the possible double deep recession in the United States. So just one request. Of course, as a student of international affairs, I said immediately, give me peace in the Middle East, particularly now that Muammar Gaddafi is said to have been killed. That shouldn't be very difficult. And he said, but this crisis has been going on for centuries. I do not have the energy reserves to solve that kind of crisis. So I said, well, if you cannot give me peace in the Middle East, make the Philippine Senate stop its so-called increase in aid of legislation. <laughs> because number one, no such inquiry, no matter how scandalous, and no matter how lengthy its TV coverage has ever resulted in any substantial legislation, so it does not serve its constitutional purpose. Number two, when these senators conduct their investigations, they are brazen about their ignorance of the rules of court. <laughs> that should be a crime in itself. To display your ignorance so unabashedly and with full confidence just because you are wearing a Western suit speaks of the mentality that sometimes, I'm afraid, dominates the Philippine Senate. Number three, these senators are serving not as senators of the Republic when they're conducting these so-called public hearings on television. They're serving as subordinates of fiscals. <laughs> because when they end their investigations, all that they can possibly do is make a recommendation to the office of the ombudsman. And the ombudsman simply assigns it to one of her prosecutors or people we used to call fiscals. So, in effect, therefore, the, set, the proceedings of any Senate investigation has no weight in our judicial system. It's zero capability for judging what justice should be administered. We are acting, in effect, when we conduct these scandalous hearings, a fiesta of legal ignorance. We are conducting, in effect, preliminary work for the preliminary investigation of an ordinary fiscal. That's what we're doing. But you cannot stop these senators because, as I've said on another occasion, the process of legislation is not telegenic. You don't want to see us studying our papers, delivering ac academic or theoretical or well-researched analysis on the present conditions that beset our country. Dean Pangalangan mentioned that he was present when I delivered my sponsorship speech on the International Criminal Court, particularly the Rome Statute. 
And when I tried to defend it during the debates, that is to say, during the period of interpolation from my colleagues, he described my demeanor at the time as firm and gracious. That is not true. <laughs> Firm, I was angry. <laughs> but I was being subjected to the humiliation of interpolation by idiots. <laughs> and I was not gracious, I was homicidal. <laughs> I wanted to kill them with my bare hands. <laughs> How dare you impugn the wisdom of decades of the brightest minds in the whole judicial system of the entire planet after reading only 10 minutes in your offices. <laughs> well, I will never stop these um, comments, but I will tell you that when the genie heard I wanted the Senate to stop these legislative investigations, he said immediately, huh? Stop the televised public hearings of the committees in the Senate and even in the House of Representatives? I'd rather bring this to the Middle East <laughs> Where I will probably be expelled. <laughs> My speech is Advancing Philippine Contributions to International Criminal Justice, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. The Philippines made a signal contribution to the globalization of international justice when it ratified the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, which will come into force on 1 November 2011. The Philippines was the 117th state party, and today the Rome Statute has 118 state parties. Our membership in the International Criminal Court is nothing less than a signal contribution, because the court is arguably the most important institutional and innovation since the finding, founding of the United Nations. The court is a creature of the human rights agenda, which, unknown to many, has been scrupulously followed since 1935 by the Philippine Constitution. As a benchmark in the progressive development of international human rights, the court represents a triumph of international criminal justice by establishing individual criminal liability for those responsible for serious violations of the Rome Statute. The salient features of the Rome Statute are as follows. Bullet, principle of complementarity, spelled with, spelled P-L-E, not P-L-I, complementarity. The court will act only as a court of last resort. It acts only in exceptional cases where a court has failed to bring justice because that court is unwilling or unable to investigate and prosecute those who have the highest responsibility for the most serious crimes of concern to the international community. Kaya nakikita mo na dito na kung merong ginawang kasalanan dito sa nakalista ng mga jurisdiction ng ICC, ang magbibista niyan ay ang korte doon sa bayan na yon, hindi ang International Criminal Court in the Hague. International Criminal Court, as I said, is a court of last resort. Pag hindi mo mabigyan ng katarungan ang akusado, ayaw mo o kaya hindi mo kaya, ay saka pa lang yan pupunta sa ICC. Kaya maling-mali ang mga pinagtatanong sa akin sa Senado. Kasi hindi sila marunong magbasa. Akala ko that literacy it's not even a requirement of the Philippine Constitution because we all presume with free elementary and high school education in our Constitution that everybody is literate. That's why we don't even demand that a voter must be literate. Eh, basahin mo lang nakalagay naman maliwanag doon na magbibista yung bansa kung saan nangyari yung mga krimen na sinasabi. Hindi naman iyan nadalhin ka agad sa The Hague. Kaya bakit tatanungin ako? Uh, aren't you concerned that ordinary Filipino soldiers and policemen will be brought to trial in the Hague in the International Criminal Court? And I had to answer that question seriously. Ang gusto ko talaga ng sabutin ay how about I just mash your teeth in? Tatangin pa ako. 
here is another table feature, bullet. Subject matter of court jurisdiction. Hindi naman lahat ng kasalanan. Kung hindi ito lang tinatawag na core crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and aggression. But the crime of aggression for purposes of their own statute is not yet operational. Bullet. Persons are individually responsible, not states and not minors. Bullet. The accused must occupy high official capacity. Sabi kasi na mga congressmen at mga senators, ha? Mag-join tayo ng International Criminal Court, hindi madimanda kami lahat. Alam na nila. Hindi ko ngayari yan, unfortunately. I'll see my genie again. Dahil, wala namang ganyan resources o kinakasangkapan o pera ang International Criminal Court. Hindi pa naman madala yung buong army ng isang bansa, ang buong kongreso o parlamento ng isang bansa doon sa The Hague. Kaya, by necessity, prosecution will be limited only to those who are holding the highest government offices. For example, the president in our country, the members of the legislature. Doesn't that fill you with anticipation? <laughs> Alam mo, una, dapat dyan talaga sa mga kasamahan ko kung minsan naiisip ko. Dapat sila bigyan ng IQ test. <laughs> o kung hindi man, eh, entrance exam na lang ng UP. <laughs> Ngayon, kung hindi pa rin nila mapasa yun, ay di electrocute na lang kaya sila ng injection. That would be a service to the community. But we are not yet there. That is for the future. <laughs> so for the moment, the ICC will have to be satisfied with jurisdiction over the highest officials. And then finally, command responsibilities attributed to the military commander. So in effect, therefore, under the Philippine Constitution, since the president is the military command, is the commander of all the armed forces of the Philippines, it is theoretically possible to accuse a president in a, theater, uh, in a theater of war before the ICC, but subject to two conditions. If the commander knew or should have known that those crimes were about to be committed or actually being committed and refused to take measures to prevent those crimes. Those are the basic principles of the Philippine, of the Rome Statute. Since our topic today is advancing Philippine contributions to international criminal justice, first, since the title presumes this information, we have to know what are our have been what have been our contributions to international criminal justice because we are supposed to advance these contributions. Oh, la anya no contribution natin to international criminal justice. But try and think. We did have significant contributions to international criminal justice. This is the one thing good about the Philippines. We're always at the forefront or at the threshold of some pioneering philosophy in international affairs. Unfortunately, we don't have a Nobel Prize winner yet, but I think that here in the first row, we have excellent candidates. Mamiya, I would ask them to stand so that you can see who our potential Nobel Prize winners are. <laughs> Oh, definitely, they don't belong to the Senate. <laughs> Philippine contribution to international criminal justice. The Philippines, long before the Rome Statute, already made a unique and unprecedented contribution to international criminal justice by providing, in effect, that the general principles of international law are incorporated in our Constitution. Under the doctrine of incorporation, such generally accepted principles are ipso facto laws of the Philippines that can be invoked and applied without need for further legislative action. Alam nyo kasi sa constitutional law, meron kang doctrine of incorporation, meron kang doctrine of transformation. Ibig sabihin yung ibang batas sa ibang bansa o international law na nasa labas ng ating bansa ay maaaring magiging kasapit na talaga ng ating konstitusyon. Kaya para bang nakasulat na rin sila sa ating saligang batas. That's a doctrine of incorporation. At dahil sa ating batas, sa ating saligang batas, 
Itong mga prinsipyo na ito, hindi na kailangan pa na pumasa sa Kongreso bilang isang pantalang batas. We don't have to pass bills in the Congress and have them approved by the President just like a regular bill. They have to be implemented as written in the Constitution. That is the meaning of doctrine of, infor of incorporation. On the other hand, doctrine of transformation means meron nga prinsipyo sa saligang batas pero kailangan may batas muna sa Kongreso bago mo maibigay iyan sa ating hukuman so that they can apply it to cases before them. That is the difference. Sa ating constitution, the general principles of international law, and of course, including the principles of international criminal justice, what we now call international humanitarian law, international human rights law, these are all already part of our constitution. And what is more, our Supreme Court has spoken many times that they are self-executory, meaning to say, hindi na kailangan pa ang batas ng ating kongreso. Kung hindi dahil lang sa nasa ating saligang batas na, pwede na silang i-apply ng mga hukuman sa lahat ng korte. That is how, that is how high the fidelity of the Philippines is to international values, both legal and moral. So this is our contribution. Long before we were attacked, by so many problems that compel the creation of the International Court, International Criminal Court. Before these crimes of international atrocities in the theater of war, and even outside that theater, in allied theaters, naisip na natin yan, na dapat na international law para hindi na uh, makuha nung gumagawa nitong mga krimen na tatakbo na lang sila sa ibang bansa. Mas kaya upang gawin nila dito, pwede sila mamatay ng karami-rami, milyon-milyon na tao, o gumamit sila ng anong mga, ano, ano, mga latest weapons of high technology, tapos magtago na lang sila sa ibang bansa. We already foresaw these distortions of the justice system, and that is why of all the many countries in the world, we are one of the very, very few who have adopted the principles of international law by incorporation in our constitution. That is our major contribution to international criminal justice. Ngayon, may I just make an excursion, please? As they say in Latin, can I just have an excursion somewhere else? May nagsasabi sa Senado, ay, Diyos ko, pag naisip ko yung mga pinagsasabi nila, I lose my reason for living. I really feel like slitting my throat or slashing my wrist. You know that I lost my son prematurely. Many times I just want to lie down there beside him and ask my family to throw stones over me. Kasi, sabi naman ng iba, magchatcha na naman tayo, Charter Kings. Madalian lang, walang kastusan. Kung hindi, ipasalang ng House of Representatives, umakyat sa Senado, ipasalang ng Senado, tapos huwag lang bisito, wala, meron ka ng constitutional amendment. That's a contradiction in terms that is what we call in English an oxymoron. You cannot amend a constitution which is a very, very special, fundamental, paramount, supreme law in the same way that you amend a bill. Because a bill is much more inferior in terms of exercise of sovereignty by the sovereign people. So to say that a, that a constitution Saligang batas, the paramount fundamental supreme law, should be amended in the same way as a bill and thus denigrated to the status of an ordinary bill is really to indulge in an oxymoron. At bakit may oxy pa? Moron na lang. <laughs> well, that is outside of my topic. Why am I doing this? It's Friday. <laughs> Under this extraordinary constitutional principle, our Supreme Court has, in the landmark 1949 case of Corona versus Halandoni, directly invoked and applied the Hague and Geneva Conventions. That's pursuant to the incorporation doctrine of our Constitution. Because our Constitution provides a generally accepted principles of international law shall form part of the law of the land. Para na siyang batas na pinasa ng ating Kongreso, Dito sa kaso na ito, pagkatapos ng World War, sinabi ng Korte Suprema natin, papatawa natin ng parusa, itong si Corona. Sabi ni Corona, wala naman kayong batas na punishes me for an international war crime. And the Supreme Court said, 
ano ka ba, basahin mo ulit ang constitution na kalagay doon na kung ano yung general principle of international law, pwede na namin i-apply ka agad-agad, hindi na kailangan ng batas. And so they directly apply the Hague and the Eva Conventions. You can call this an act of judicial courage because it's stepping out of the comfort zone of ordinary tribunals of justice. It's going beyond that and saying we don't need a, a domestic law to transform international law into an enforceable law in domestic jurisdiction. In addition, the Supreme Court in subsequent cases has directly applied the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights in certain cases, which I will enumerate to you. But first, since I have been a professor, let me ask you, what is wrong when our Supreme Court directly applies the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? Are there students here? Even if you are not students, just off the cuff, can you think of some infirmity or some opposition or criticism of why a Supreme Court, regardless of whether it, is, it belongs to the Philippines or some other country, why would a Supreme Court base its decision on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? Is there any volunteer? <laughs> what is wrong with that? The Universal Declaration is a declaration. It is not legally binding. But once again, here you see the Philippines goes out on a limb and says through its Supreme Court, we will apply the Universal Declaration. And the Universal Declaration is so-called soft law. Your bank is not legally binding except by its moral force, the force of its moral energy. Ang dapat mong i-apply kung gusto mong Universal Declaration is not the Declaration itself, but its companion covenants. Dahil itong mga covenants, mga treaties talaga ito. There are two of those covenants, as you know, the covenant on the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Cultural and Political Rights. So, dito makikita mo na ang ating Korte Suprema, ganun kataas ang pagtingin niya sa international standards or norms of behavior that it directly applies the Universal Declaration which by its own title indicates that it is not binding because it is not a covenant or a treaty. It is simply a declaration and yet the Philippine Supreme Court goes out of its way to go down the untrodden path and say we will directly apply the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. These are the cases arranged chronologically 1951 case of Borowski v. Commissioner and Medjuff v. Director. 2000 case of International School Alliance of Educators v. Kisumbing. 2003 case of Republic v. Sandigan Bayan. 2006 case of Bayani of Bayan v. Ermita. And 2007 case of Hong Kong v. Olalia. So that is one part of our significant contribution to international criminal justice, that we have incorporated generally accepted principles of international law in our constitution. And correspondingly, our Supreme Court has never hesitated to apply these generally accepted principles, particularly, particularly as embodied in the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Pero kalahati pa lang yan. Ang kalahati pa ng ating contribution ay ganito. The Philippine contribution to international criminal justice has consisted not only of these Supreme Court decisions, but also the criminalization of serious violations of international human rights as mala prohibita. Among these criminal laws are the following. Bullet, the 1997 Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act, which invokes, again, the Universal Declaration, as well as the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, also known as CEDO, and International Human Rights Laws. Bullet. The 2004 Anti-Violence Against Women and Their Children Act, also invoking the Universal Declaration, CEDO, and the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Bullet. The 2009 Philippine Act, on crimes against international humanitarian law, genocide, and other crimes against humanity, 
and acted into law way ahead of the concurrence by the Philippine Senate in 2011 of the Rome Statute. Parenthetically, another indication of the deep Philippine allegiance to the Court of International Criminal Justice is the 2011 case of Bayanmuna v. Romulo, where the Supreme Court already interpreted the Rome Statute in relation to the RPUS non-surrender agreement. Kaya lang, maganda sana yung Bayan Muna versus Romulo because it indicates our commitment to international criminal justice. Kaya lang may mali. Sino ba nagsulat ng desisyon sa Bayan Muna versus Romulo? Alam nyo? Ang taga-Yupi yun, kita niyo na anak niya eh. Kung hindi taga-Yupi yun, what do you expect? I'm talking of Bayan Muna versus Romulo. I humbly submit that certain pronouncements in this case concerning the Rome Statute need to be re-examined. Need to be re-examined is the diplomat's phrase for it's wrong. In Bayan Muna, the court unfortunately said that, quote, the ICC is not declaratory of customary international law. Not. Siguro sa mula dito. What law school did it come from? These are my, this was my common mantra when I was an RTC judge. When I was very, very irritated, I would always ask, Counsel, where did you graduate? So I'm asking, where did this judge graduate? because he wrote, the ICC is not declaratory of customary international law. This unfortunate sentence is in direct contrast to the statement made by the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, which is sometimes abbreviated as ICT. In the 1998 case of Prosecutor V. Furundija, the ICT said of the Rome Statute in paragraph 227, quote, Depending on the matter at issue, the Rome Statute may be taken to restate, reflect, or clarify customary rules or crystallize them, whereas in some areas it creates new law or modifies existing law. This is a classic statement on how customary international law arises from provisions in treaties and relevant practices by the states of the world. So it's not saying anything, but it is saying that Rome Statute is the Rome Statute is in part customary international law, apart from certain new laws that it introduces into our international judicial system. This was in 1998. 1998 pa lang, sinabi niyo ng International Tribunal, the ICT, na ang Rome Statute ay international customary law. Pagkatapos, 2011 na, hindi ba nagbabasa? Nagsabi itong Pilipino, nasaba niya, ICC is not declaratory of customary international law. Oh, ito. Uh, I feel like, I feel like I'm a grown adult, but I feel like, bursting into tears. Dahil ang 80, 1998 pa sinabi na niya na ICC is a result of customary international law. But 2011, there's a Filipino justice who says the ICC is not declaratory of customary international law. And he does not, he does not add any evidence to, to support this negative statement. So, you know the Philippines is under is below sea this is another excursion. You know the Philippines is below sea level, right? Yeah, do you know that? We're below sea level. Normally countries of the world are above sea level. So if the climate change is a precursor of the great flood that no one survived, it may be that a great flood is coming. And of course, the first victims will be those living in areas below sea level. Kaya kung minsan kung makakabasa ka ng mga incident ka mukha nito, ititinta ka talaga magdasal na dumating ng great flood dito sa ating archipelago. Dahil ano naman ito? 1998 pa tinuruan na tayo ng international tribunal na customary international law, ang Rome Statute, pagkatapos 2011, ito lang taon na ito, 
may Pilipino nagsabing hindi totoo yun. <laughs> Now I go on to Philippine concerns. On, I'm doing this, nagbiberat ako dito because this is my home territory. <laughs> of course, when I go out, I will deny everything I said. <laughs> Philippine concerns on jurisdiction. So, ano ngayon, since that is our topic, advancing Philippine contributions. I've just finished with the topic of what have the Philippine contributions been so far. Number one, there are Supreme Court decisions that uphold the incorporation clause or doctrine in our constitution. And number two, there are certain laws which criminalize and punish in the Philippine domestic jurisdiction crimes that have already been recognized in international criminal justice system. So ngayon, how can we advance the cause of international criminal justice? Well, we raise certain questions, and by raising these questions, we hope to elicit global debate so that the world community can come to a consensus on how we can best push forward the momentum of international criminal justice represented by the International Criminal Court. So when we say that we are advancing the Philippine contribution, we're actually asking for Philippine concerns about the interpretation of the Rome Statute, which is the basic charter of the ICC. The first concern is the jurisdiction of the court. The crime of aggression, as previously noted, is not yet operative because certain conditions provided by the Assembly of State Parties remains unfulfilled. There is also the question of whether the Assembly might in the future add other crimes under the court's jurisdiction. It has to be underscored that the court's jurisdiction over crimes against humanity is qualified in that the acts in question when committed should have been, quote, part of a widespread or systematic attack directed against any civilian population with knowledge of the attack. Notice that to prove crime against humanity, you have, first of all, to prove that there's been a widespread or systematic attack against civilians. It should also be equally underscored that the court's jurisdiction over war crimes requires that such crimes were, quote, part of a plan or policy or as part of a large-scale commission of such crimes. So, for example, kung doon sa Mindanao, nag-aaway ngayon ang gobyerno at ang mga rebelde, pareho silang itimanda sa Supreme sa International Criminal Court for war crimes. First of all, you have to prove that the crime was part of a plan or a policy or part of a large-scale commission. Kaya palaging pang malawakan ang crime against humanity and war crime. In this way, the court's jurisdiction is limited. You cannot just say it can have jurisdiction over war crimes, but because war crimes, by definition, requires quantifiable atrocities. These limits may become issues of admissibility of cases. One consequence could be the application of the provision in the Rome Statute that, quote, the court shall determine that the case is inadmissible where the case is not of sufficient gravity to justify further action by the court. Kaya kung missing itong elements na ito of widespread nature, it might be that the ICC will rule This case is not of sufficient gravity, therefore we do not admit it. In other words, it will, it will might declare it has no jurisdiction. Should the court determine that the case is inadmissible, then it would fall under national criminal jurisdiction. That's our first concern, the jurisdiction of the ICC. The second concern is the principle of complementarity which provides optimum room for the exercise of sovereignty by the state. Remember what I said before? In the first instance, it is the country itself which has jurisdiction. It is only when that country is unable or unwilling that the case goes to the Hague. The general rule is that national jurisdiction will be primary at all times when the state authorities regularly perform their functions of investigation or prosecution. The exception to the general rule is that the court will assume jurisdiction in case the state is unwilling or unable to investigate or prosecute. One essential point here is that it is the court that determines the issue of its own jurisdiction. Suppose the ICC in The Hague assumes jurisdiction because 
according to the court, the local state is unable or unwilling to prosecute, and then the state contradicts the claim. It says, no, I am willing and I am able to prosecute. Who then will determine the case? It appears like it is the court that will judge that contentious issue. In other words, there is an open question on whether it is the general rule or the exception that will apply, and it appears that it is the court which has the power to determine this issue. Another essential point is that every state party should provide in its national criminal law that the state has jurisdiction over certain international crimes. On this point, I'm afraid that the Philippine law might need amendment. At present, the Philippine Act on International Crimes, also known as RA No. 9851, Section 17, provides as follows, quote, In the interest of justice, the relevant Philippine authorities may dispense with the investigation or prosecution of a crime punishable under this act if another court or international tribunal is already conducting the investigation or undertaking the prosecution of such crime. Oh, ano mali dito? Mali ito eh. Next time if I have the opportunity, I will tell the senator who sponsored this bill that this is wrong. Kaya ko yun kasi nag-ibisigyan din dito. <laughs> oh, ano kayo ng mali dito? Binibigay niya ang jurisdiction sa international tribunal. When the rule under the statute of the international tribunal is, jurisdiction should be primary with the Philippines. So binibigay na nga sa iyo, bakit ibalik mo pa doon? May gracia ka na nga eh, binabalik mo pa. Anong problema mo? You have to have a problem, mentally nature, presumably. <laughs> My view is this. This provision is OKOs and superfluous. On the one hand, under the principle of complementarity, it is the Philippines that has primary jurisdiction over international crimes. But on the other hand, under this particular provision of the Philippine Act, Philippine law gives primary jurisdiction to an international tribunal. Hence, this provision should be repealed. The third concern of the Philippines is whether their own statute is self-executory in our country. As we have seen, the Supreme Court applying the constitutional principle that generally accepted principles of international law are part of the law of the land has repeatedly declared the Universal Declaration of Human Rights as self-executory in our country. But does this constitutional principle extend to the prosecution of international crimes, particularly when such international crimes are not covered by the Philippine Act, also known as RA number 9851. That is the question that I would like for all of us to think about. Now let me go to the conclusion. We have conducted a simplified survey of the questions raised by the Rome Statute in Philippine jurisdiction. These questions are basically aimed at the application and enforceability of international humanitarian law, also known as IHL, because the substance of IHL is built into the Rome Statute. We are opening a window into the future, and the future suggests that after accession to the Rome Statute, the Philippines still needs to undertake wide-ranging tasks. Perhaps it would be possible for the 2012 Philippine budget to provide for a commission of experts to engage in a thorough professional study of emergent problems and approaches under Philippine law in relation to the Rome Statute. In any event, the task before us is clear. The UP Law Center, Institute of International Legal Studies, and the Philippine Coalition for the International Court, Criminal Court, must continue in your laudable and noble efforts to end the culture of impunity. I am confident that in the immediate future, the results of your hard work, just like this forum, will eventually produce an outstanding contribution by the Philippines to the international public order. Thank you.